of all the positive things I did, all the stuff you lot were reluctant to post about me. And then the moment something like this happens, the press jumped on me. It's different now. I have to act accordingly because there's going to be a target on your back. There's always going to be haters. How can you make things move? Mm. How can you say, I want to do this and it affects culture? If you're doing something you're passionate about, why would you do, do that at the service and not give your all to it? Mm. Why would you not lock in a zone and make sure you're performing to the best of your ability? Do you see what I'm saying? I think some people think it's enough to turn up. It's not enough to turn up. You have to perform. Let's get into it. So, um, yeah, really special episode for me today, actually, personally. So it's episode 44 of Past, Present, Future. And I think the reason for me it's so special is because you're in a position, you're sat in a seat, which I want to be in, in five, six years time. So okay. I think that's why I'm so interested and so inspired to have this conversation with you. And um, I do want to start at the very beginning yeah. of the past, but before we do so, I think it'd be great to give you an opportunity for the minority of people that don't know who you are. Yeah. Who, who is Craig Mitch and uh, why are you here? Uh, Craig Mitch is a human being that's passionate about making content, um, entertaining people and yeah, I'm I'm here because you seem cool. Thank I you. Watch your content. I liked it, and I like having good conversations. Hundred percent. So let's get to it. So let's let's go to the past, and I want to understand really. So for me, and this is not always, but I think when someone comes across incredibly confident, sometimes that stems down from things they've been through as a child. So I want to understand what what was Craig Mitch like at the very beginning. Um, I would say. I would say growing up on an estate mm. is what shaped me to be confident. Mm -hmm. When you grow up on an estate, so I, I, I was born in Tottenham and then I moved to Wood Green when I was five or six years old. And when you grow up on an enclosed estate, and the estate I grew up on was very enclosed. It wasn't like really connected to streets and stuff. Mm. It was like its own little world. And when you play out there with other people, you, know, you call it playing out when you grow up on an estate, you kind of have to find your way because there's like the olders on the estate who are kind of running things. Then you've mm. got the people your age group. And when you're playing out, you have to kind of make friends, but then deal with maybe having little fights with people and gaining that respect. So I feel like, yeah, growing up on an estate, like you have to kind of be a confident individual. Otherwise people just kind of like take advantage of you. Mm. Like, don't get me wrong. I wasn't one of the bad kids. I always had both my parents in my life, my mom, my dad. Um, a lot of people I grew up with didn't have their their, their dad around. Mm. But I still feel like you had to be able to carry yourself, be a bit of a character to hold your own and, and get respect on an estate. And I feel like that's what helped me. Mm. It was a really good answer. And I was actually wondering when you were explaining that, that sometimes I think it like overconfidence can be a mask for pain. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to understand from you, being hugely confident, and mm. you've said that's derived from being on the estate, but what yeah. were you trying to mask? I don't, do you know what? I don't think I'm overconfident, you know? Like, I feel like I have a time and a... I, I'm very good at picking a time and a place to be mm. confident. So, you know, I know people that they might go in a room and they're just loud. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're loud and they want to be the centre of attention or, you know, they, they... To me, that's overconfidence. That's kind of like always, OK, the spotlight has to be on me. I wouldn't come in a room and just try and be the loudest in the room or try and be the person that everyone needs to speak to. I, I know kind of the moments when to be confident. Like if if someone pulls me aside and we have a conversation, I'm always going to be confident, mm. speak, you know, with my chest up, speak up, not shy away. But I don't think I'm overconfident. So I, I don't know if it's, I, I wouldn't say I'm kind of masking pain. I, I, like I said, I feel like for me, everyone's been through experiences in their life where, um, certain things that happen that you could maybe equate to pain. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm someone that's like using that as a way to, to mm -hmm. cover up pain, man. I feel like that's, in my personal experience, I feel like it's more people that are funny. Mm. You know, I've never been the comedic type. Like I would slide little jokes in there, but I've never been the funny guy. Like mm. I've got many friends that are hilarious, especially in the content mm. space, very funny. I, I've never wanted that pressure of trying to be like the funny guy or the queen, because then people expect that. Um, but I feel like that's something that more masks up pain, in, in my opinion. No, I agree. You say, mm. though, within that answer, though, that certain things equate to pain. What yeah. certain things happened within your past that equated to pain? Um, 
I think, yeah, just growing up on an estate life, man, like you got to deal with bullies. Do you know what I mean? You got to you got to deal with a bully at some point. Mm. There's no way unless you had the big brother or the big cousin that had you protected, mm. you had to deal with someone picking on you. Mm. And then you had to be able to overcome that or deal with that. Do you get what I'm saying? There's always going to be someone that goes look at him, especially if you're a nice person. Like I'm I'm a nice person. I've never been a bad person. I think anyone that knows me can vouch for me in that way. And I feel like, yeah, if you're a nice person, people can smell that growing up in the ends. Mm. Do you know what I mean? They can they can sm- sniff blood. There's, it's like there's sharks around, so they can they can tell that. So you got to deal with like people picking on you or or taking a piss out of you or trying to treat you like the little bitch. Do you get what I'm saying? And I felt like, yeah, I dealt with that growing up. Do you know what I mean? Whether that was in the uh, on my estate then developing that in my state and, and developing hard skin, dealing with certain situations to then go in secondary school, which was not in my ends. My mum mm. made it clear that she didn't want me to go to secondary school in my area. Why? Because Inwood Green and Tottenham size, all the schools are just bad. They're just all bad. Like everyone that went to that school were, were most of the men in the ends that were in B for part of the gangs. So my mum was like, we, I want you to go to school in Finchley. So she sent me to East Finchley, a school called Bishop Douglas. She sent me out there. Um, but then even when I went there, you're getting people from other areas that went to that school. So a lot of people from Northwest went to that school. A lot of people from Islington went to that school. And you still had Mandem and stuff that went to that school. But then because she sent me to a school out of the end, I didn't know no one. What situations did that present? Um, once again, just trying to find my way, trying to find who I gravitated towards mm. in my classroom, in the school. I always say my, in terms of like being confident and popularity in school, I started like here and then mm. I had to kind of work my way up. You know, I came, I came into the school um, in year seven and I didn't really know anyone. And I started the school late as well. Um, funny enough, because I was in um, America when the 9-11 happened. Yeah, so I was in America and we went for a trip uh, in 2011 and then that happened. And then I was still in America at the time. My grandma lives in the Bronx. So I wasn't in Manhattan where it happened, but I was in New York. And then for a while, they weren't letting people get flights naturally out of New York. So then my mom had to call the school and let them know like, oh, he's, he's going to be late. Da-da-da. And then I came back late. So school, I think school started like mm. around that time. The school term starts, doesn't it? Like September. Mm-hmm. I don't know, around that time. But mm-hmm. then I came back late. So then by the time I joined the school, everyone had kind of like, they were a couple of weeks in, they kind of formed their little groups. So I had to kind of then, okay, where, how am I going to form groups? Who am I, how am I going to like find my way? And then as school went on from like year seven to year 11, it, by the time I reached year 11, then I felt like I was a confident person and mm-hmm. I was in with like what you'd call the cool kids. And do you know what I mean? I was going out with one of the nicest girls in the school. And it was a journey for me. But mm-hmm. at the beginning, I was like proper not that guy. Like, mm-hmm. so yeah, I feel like it's always been just overcoming those things, man. Like just trying to like g- gain your respect. Mm-hmm. Not as the baddest guy, but just so no one takes a piss out of you kind of thing. Yeah, and you explain that by saying the sharks, they can Friends. smell blood and stuff yeah. like that. So mm. um, I wanted well. to put that into perspective and kind of understand how much going through those situations you were younger helped you entering into the industry. Because I think from my perspective, it's almost the same that if people can smell blood, if they can smell that you're weak, mm. you will be preyed on. So... I wondered how much going through those situations when you were younger has helped you elevate into the industry. Yeah, I think, I think definitely because I think what you've got to learn to do in those situations is be social. You've got to develop social skills. Mm. You know, if you're, if you're a recluse or an introvert and, you know, you're growing up in a certain place and you're just spending all your time indoors playing computer games and you're not out socialising, then you're not going to develop that confidence. You're mm-hmm. not going to know how to be around people and manoeuvre around people. And I feel like when it comes to then moving into a certain industry, no matter what that industry seems to be, or if you want to go far in that industry, you have to be able to carry yourself socially. You have to Mm. be able to have conversations with people, develop relationships with people. Um, And I think, yeah, for me going into this industry, funny enough, when I was, so growing up in the estate, there was a shopping centre in Wood Green, yeah? And they used to hold a modelling competition every year. And because that was just our local shopping centre, we went in there, we saw the model competition. Some of my friends bet me, they were like, oh, like, go in it for a joke. They were, basically, they built this catwalk in the, in the shopping centre mm. and they called it like model search. And then my friends were like, oh, like, we'll bet you three pound to go on that show. And obviously I was like mm. nine or 10. 
So three pounds like a lot. Yeah. Like you could do three pound, I might go and get like some chips in the market, or I might go and get a drink. Like three pounds is dope. Like and for me it was banner. So they bet me, they were like three pound, go on the cattle. So I was like, cool, I'll go on it. And then I went on it. And then somehow I kept getting through the rounds. Like it was an elimination round thing. And then the judges, there would be judges, they'd vote. And then I got to the final. And then it was me versus Kid who was like the favorite. And it was funny because like his pet, my mom, my mom and dad didn't even know I was entering this. Like I was going to this and they had no idea. But this kid I was in the final with, his parents entered him into it. And he did this whole thing where he like dressed up as The Rock. So like he had like the silk shirt on, he came out of like a fake belt, like sunglasses. This is crazy, at 10 years old. They were dropping like The Rock's theme song and every round everyone was going crazy as a kid. <laughs> and I was just coming out normal. And then like it was me and him in the final and he was like the favourite to win it. And then I ended up like beating him and it was like this proper like, bro, it was this huge upset, it was mm. mad. And then his parents were like complaining to the judges. Wow. Like, I'll never forget it. Like, how is this happening? And then I ended up getting a modelling contract for a year. Uh-huh. That was like 10 years old. So this is like, this is like 2000, 2001. This is 2000 because it was just before I started secondary school, showing my age. Mm. And, um, and then with that year of the modelling contract, I think that's when things changed. That's when I said I want to be a part of like this industry, the NSA industry, whatever, because through me doing that modelling contract, I then started... Um, doing extra work in TV shows. Mm-hmm. So then it all kind of just overlapped. So then I started doing adverts and then from adverts, I started being in, like I was in a BBC drama mm-hmm. called um, Baby Father on BBC One with Angela. Like I started doing all these different things and I started from young being around cameras and stuff like that. And then I was like, I like this. Like I can go, you're telling me I can go here, do a shoot with like Argos or Littlewood, Littlewood's catalog and then get paid like a thousand pounds at the age of 10 to do that mm-hmm. for like a day's work. Mm-hmm. Obviously my mum was taking the money. I was like, this is lit. Like, I, I, so I think that's what kind of like whetted my appetite for wanting to be in the industry. But I just think like, yeah, from young, you kind of, you, you, you have to be social. Mm. You have to get out there, speak to people. Mm-hmm. So yeah. From that moment, which it sounds like from what you've just explained was almost the start of your career, even at 10 years old, yeah. to now. Paint a picture of me of how tough the journey has been. Because I think a lot of people from the outside looking in, from my perspective anyway, see you where you are now and think that it's been an easy journey, easy yeah. ride. How, how hard has it been? Very hard, man. Like, you've got to think, like, when, when I started doing YouTube, um, there was hardly anyone doing YouTube. Like, YouTube started in 2005. I started doing YouTube in 2010. So YouTube was five years old. Five years old. And up until that point, most things on YouTube were like, people weren't creating content on mm. shows. It was like random stuff, like Charlie bit my finger and just random stuff. Don't get me wrong. They were like, there were YouTubers, but they were like the really, really early inception. But there wasn't an industry. There wasn't the channels you have today where people are making channels and you've got football. Like, So basically, I, I started doing something called Mitch and Suave early on, right? I was in a duo. And how we started it was we started a blog. Blogs were popular at the time. You had like Tumblr, music blogs. Everyone would go on blogs instead of Instagram to get like their gossip or whatever. And we started a blog and we said, look, we want to interview artists. Like we want to, we, we want to, well, first we were posting about us and we were like, we want to change this. We want to interview artists. So then we were like, all right, well, let's try and interview acts that we're posting about and put on YouTube. Mm. Obviously we couldn't get like, we were posting about like Lil Wayne and whoever, Kanye, who was big, obviously we couldn't get them. So we're like, cool, let's just try and in- interview like acts we know in up and coming people or p- anyone we could reach out to. So then we did like SAS rap group that were big back then, they were part of like Dipset. And then we just started building it, building it up in that way. Um, but the main, the main point of what I'm saying is there wasn't an industry. So then we started linking up with people like Poet, Vujanic, these people who like us had a vision for something that wasn't even there. Mm. We were kind of looking in the future saying, well, no one's going to give us a, a, a job on television. Like I was looking up to people like Reggie Yates and like Jamila Jamil and all the presenters on mm. T4. I was like, I want to be a presenter. I want to do music presenter. I want to do this. Um, Alexa Chung, like these old school people, Russell Brand. I was like, I want to do this, but no one's just going to give you that opportunity. So we thought we just have to create it. We have to just get cameras and, and shoot content and create it ourselves. Maybe we can navigate that path. And I think that's, that's the difficult thing. You know, it's, it's one thing looking today you could be 18 17 years old today and go that's what i want to do because it's there the industry's there you have a you have a focal point of how i'm going to do it what i'm going to do and there's a there's mm. kind of a clear path mm. 
back then there wasn't a clear path. Most of the people that were on television were like either like failed actors or I don't know, like they'd been acting in the industry mm. for years or they had links in some way, shape or form or they auditioned and then someone just liked them. Whereas today you can just carve it out from nothing. You know, you had, you had Billy on here. Mm. Billy has started a podcast, put it on TikTok and clips are going viral on TikTok. There's a clear blueprint to do things now. Back then there wasn't. Mm. You, we, were, we were just working off something that didn't exist really. So with that in mind, given the fact it didn't exist, yeah. given the fact, in your words, there was no pathway, mm. how hard was it to convince people around you that this is the right pathway for me, even though it doesn't exist? It was very hard, but I, I think me, for me, meeting Poet was one of the, one of the best things that happened because Poet is, was making content early. He was doing Poet's Corner in like 08, 09, putting on YouTube and Facebook. And we're from the same ends. Like he grew up in Tottenham and then he moved to a green. So we'd go to the barbershop, local barbershop. We had the same barber and I'd see him in there. And then he, he, he saw that I was doing content on YouTube with the Mitch and Suave stuff. And then he reached out and he's like, I'm making a show called That's a Rap. I want, I want you guys to be a part of it. I like what you're doing. You're fashionable. We, I want to have like a fashion segment because it's like a magazine show at the time. And he was like, let's, let's work together, man. Like we can, we can help each other. And then me and him sat down and he, we had a similar vision. He, I saw that he, wanted to create content and go somewhere. And that's a similar thing that I wanted to do. And no one was really doing that or mm. anyone I knew in our ends anyway. So it was difficult, man, because we didn't have money. There was, we weren't making money off this thing. Like everyone today is, you know, that's doing something within the industry is kind of making money off of it. Back then there was no money in it mm. at all. There was nothing. So we all had like jobs on the side, obviously trying to fund it. I worked in like William Hill when I, while I was in uni for a while, the bookmakers. Then I got a job in Vodafone to try and make ends meet. Um, so I was working retail for a mm. while while doing this on the side and just building it up, man. And it's difficult because what people got to realise in this game, unless you own the platform you're working for that's making you money, you, you, you can lose that job at any time because you don't own it. So they could decide they want to switch things up or the company might sell to someone else and they want to switch up the whole programme and they might not want you anymore or the show you're on, they might just take the funding from that show and then all of a sudden the show that was feeding you, that's not around anymore. So for years, I've had many different constant jobs for, mm. within the industry. You know, there's no, there's no, I would say, definite security in this job. You know, you could be doing a show for two, three years and then that show's not around anymore. You've got to find the next thing. How does that affect your mental health? Um, I don't, I don't, I, I think early on it was difficult, but I realised that the type of person I am, I, I like working for myself. You know, I like being self-employed. I like knowing that if I want to do this, because I want to do this, I want to show up because I want to show up. I like working kind of on my own terms. Mm. I don't like, I learned early on through working in William Hill and Vodafone that I don't really like, you know, coming to work and, and people telling me what to do. And mm. don't get me wrong, obviously, even when you're self-employed and you work for a broadcaster or, or a network or whatever, you still got to answer to people. You're still working for people, but it's more on your terms. It's more mm. flexible. You, you know, you negotiate and decide if you want to, partake in that to begin with and the hours are a lot more more in my favor I like to have a lot more time to to focus on me and what I need to do mm. so I think that's the payoff that works in my favor for some other people they might not like that they might like knowing they've got work every day and security in that way but I think it's just it's just about you and your personality really mm. so yeah with regards to that uncertainty Mm. Specifically, your parents, you said you have a great relationship with both. But yeah. How, how did they feel about the career choice? At first, my mum wasn't on it. My really? mum and dad both have jobs. They both have jobs like that involve the government. You know, they, they're both like civil servants. Um, and my mum's always been a very like pragmatic person. My mum's always been someone that's like, you know, just the blueprint because she never went uni. So she was like, go uni, mm. get a job, yeah, 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 yeah. get a security. Um, did you ever want to go to uni? I went uni. Did you want to? Yeah. yeah. Um, when I was growing up, it's not something like I was like, oh, I need to go to uni. Because like, what might I say? Hardly anyone went to uni. I, I think out of all of my friends that grew up, I'm one of the only ones that went to uni. Mm. Literally. Even my friends that were like the good friends that weren't on road or anything. Like all of my friends that have now got jobs and stuff. I'm like one of the only ones that went to uni and finished uni. Like, and even Poet says that to me all the time. He's like, bro, you don't understand. Being from a green, not only you going uni, but actually getting your degree and finishing it is a big thing. And I never used to think it was a big thing because 
when I went secondary school and then I went to a college called The Swap, which was in like Hampstead, it was a nice area. Mm. Everyone that went to that college ended up going union and going on mm -hmm. to get in a degree or doing anything anyway. So I didn't see it as a big thing. But then when I reflect on it, where I actually grew up on the estate I grew up on, it was actually a mad thing because it's like, it, it's hard to not just get into uni and have that discipline to get there, but then to do the three years and actually finish it, people drop out or life mm. happens. People want to get money or... You know, something might happen in their personal life where they're like, I can't work to complete this. Do you know what I mean? And some people just want to do it to get the grants and the loans and, mm -hmm. then, and then dip anyway. But I actually stuck it through and did it. And I think that, for me, that was a big thing when I came to high At the time, I was thinking, why did I do this? I come in there. I don't, it was, like, it was stupid. Like, I'm, I'm the, the, I studied marketing and what I mm. do now, it's not really conducive in a way to what I'm actually doing now. Mm. You could say I market myself on social media and stuff, but really like what I was actually studying about, it's not, not really paid off in that way. But yeah, I just think, yeah, man, I think going uni was, was good. I look at in the end, I'm like, it's dope that I went to uni, but it's not something I always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. No one, no one where I grew up wanted to go uni or thought about going uni like that. I think it was big for my mum really wanting me to go because no one in my family, I broke the chain in my family. No one in my family's been uni, mm -hmm. not one person. That perseverance then to get through uni, you said like loads of people go to uni, yeah. they don't finish it. That perseverance, I would say that that, for me anyway, from the outside looking in, is a quality consistent with people who create content because there's ups, mm. there's downs, and to be successful, you have to persevere through hard times. And yeah. I think for me personally, I quite often go through big ups where I think, look, this is great, we're, we're doing Unreal, the guests have been incredible, the views are going up, and then there's a dip, and I find myself like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, I'm sure you've experienced those dips within your career. What, what do you do when you have a tough day? Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, but what I do is I just try and reach, like I said, I feel like I'm lucky in the sense that I've got a lot of friends that work in a similar industry mm. as me. I came up with a lot of people that are like doing what I do. Like I said, Poet, Vuj, Maya Jama, Snoochie Shai. We all came up together throughout the last 10 years. And you know, I mean, just look at the look at look at Maya now. Maya's like my close friend, and she's gone clear. Mm. So I, I just feel like when I'm finding it tough, I know that I can always maybe reach out to these people and create a bit of content with them, or get some advice from them. Or do you get what I'm saying? Like, I feel like you need to keep your network strong. Obviously, when you're starting out, that's not easy because you don't just have those people around you. But there's always going to be people that want to grind and get to where you want to get to as well. So it's just about finding those like-minded individuals mm. and then working on that journey together. Because people stop me and they go, oh, how did you, I want to I want to do what you do. How did you get there? Like, and the, the main piece of advice I always say to them is just find like-minded individuals mm. that are trying to do what you want to do. Yeah, of course you'd like to just, you know, walk up to me or walk up to someone else and go, oh, I want to work with you. But there's a natural... Progression. Yeah, you have to you have to put in that work and have a natural progression. I know when I started out, like I said, I would have loved to just work to Reggie Yates or whoever was the big presenters at the time, and then Deck or whatever. But I know it, that it just doesn't work like that. They mm. put in work for years, and I have to put in the work to get there and, and earn that respect. And I say that to the people now: you just got to work with like, like find like minded individuals because then when things get hard, you know you have that sort of network to lean mm. on that can maybe help you. Do you get what I'm saying? Like. Now there's multiple platforms. If my things, for whatever reason, if I ain't doing my thing, I know I could hit up Chucky and Chucky goes, yeah, just come on half cast, his podcast. Or, you know, I know the free shots boys, come on free shots, mm. poet, filthy fellas. Like there's, I've always, there's always people I've got around me that can maybe help me and maybe build my thing back up. But the most important thing, like I said, you've got to build that network mm. because no one man is an island. So you've got to make sure you have those people that you can, collaborate with the platforms or maybe jump on their platforms and just keep your name or your relevancy up. And that's, that's all it is, man. I feel like some people don't want to reach out to people enough and work with people enough. But in wow. any industry, you need, you need to work with people, man. Mm. How did anything get built? Do you know what I mean? How did this studio get built? Someone had to work with someone, you know, the plaster had to talk to the painter, the painter had to talk to the, there was an architect and all these, all these people had to come together mm. and do business together to build a building. Like no one, no one just picked up, no one just went and made the cement by themselves and picked up the paint by themselves and built a whole building. It just doesn't work like that. As humans, we have to work with each other. And that goes, that rings true even for this industry, man. You've got to make sure you've got a network. Mm. Solid advice. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, you, need, you for You need a network, man.
One of the things that I was just thinking then is we spoke about, so almost that network that you're talking about is your aid for bad days. When the bad days come, you yeah. lean on your network. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, and this is something that I sometimes struggle with, is when you have a bad day and you've got to film, so you've got to go to talk sport or you've got to go yeah. to match of the day X or you've got to go to kick game, whatever it might be. Yeah. When you're having a bad day, how do you come across as this bubbly person? Honestly, I think it's, I just think it's years of doing it at this point, bro. Like I'm able to switch it on and off that back then when I, when it, that earlier on, when it was, when I was having a bad day, it was hard. But I think you've always got to remember that when you're going to do something, whether it's in front of a camera, whether it's at your workplace, whatever that happens to be in an office or whatever, you got to remember that it's like football. I remember, I remember, no, basketball, that's basketball. Mm. I remember watching the last dance. You've seen that with Michael Jordan. And I remember one of the things that stuck with me, they said, which made him so elite, is that no matter what was going on in his life, when he crossed that white line mm -hmm. and stepped on the court, boom, blacked out. Doesn't matter what was going on in his life. He was tuned into a zone. And that zone was perform. I mean, I'm, I've, I've got a job. I'm here to do something. Perform. For this two hours I'm on this court doing this, perform. Once I come back out of the white line, then I can think about whatever's going on. It's not going anywhere. Do you get what I'm saying? There, there'll be another 22 hours of the day to think about what's going on. But once I cross this white line, I can't think about anything else other than what's going on here. And I feel like that with when I do work, I could have mad things going on. But once I go in that studio, whether it's at Torso or whatever it, whatever it happens to be, I need to focus on what I'm doing here. And then once I've done what I'm doing here, then I can you know, think about whatever's going on still, whether I'm having a bad day or someone's pissed me off or whatever. But once I cross that white line, I need to be in the zone. And mm -hmm. I think people just need to remember that. When you, when you have a job, your job is to perform. No matter what it is, that's your job. Your job is to perform. The moment you don't perform, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing the thing that I hope, the thing you're doing you're passionate about, the thing that you're passionate about a disservice as well. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something you're passionate about, why would you do, do that disservice and not give your all to it? Mm -hmm. Why would you not lock in a zone and make sure you're performing to the best of your ability? Do you see what I'm saying? I think mm -hmm. some people think it's enough to turn up. It's not enough to turn up. You have to perform. There's a big difference. Loads of people just turn up and it's like, well, why are you doing it then? You're wasting your time and you're wasting the people's time that you're working with. You've got to perform. Why do you think people do just turn up? It's life, man. Life gets hard. Some people just think like, ah, oh, just, you know, one, they might not be passionate about the thing they're even doing. Or, like you said, they, they, they might be passionate about it, but then they're thinking too much about what's going on. But like I said, there's 24 hours in a day. You're telling me for that hour that you're doing something or however many hours that you're doing something, you can't switch that off and then resume thinking about that thing after. Mm. Do, do you get what I'm saying? It's just about being able to flip the switch. Mm -hmm. It's hard for, for some people to do that. It's, it's, like I said, for me, it was hard, but then you have to... Remember, you have to remember, I'm, I need to perform. I need to perform. This is about performing and switch it on and off. Yeah, it's incredible. So thank you for going into it. And I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing at the moment to yeah. tie into the conversation. But before getting there, I wanted to understand from you to tie up the past section. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made within your career? And what did you learn from it? The biggest mistake. I don't know if it's the biggest. There's two. There's, there's one that's more, I wouldn't say it's the biggest mistake, but it's something I learned from massively. I remember I went on a shoot in like 2012 or 13 with Adidas, right? And we went to Madrid. And this is when I was first getting into the football content. And I was auditioning for an Adidas show on YouTube. And at that point, I'd never had anything this big. And it was to do a Champions League show with Adidas where it was on the Adidas had a Champions League football channel and you'd go around, you'd be interviewing. It's when Bell went to Real Madrid, like all of these players, like, and at this point, I'd, I'd, I'd only been doing like <clears throat> YouTube stuff. There was nothing this big money wise, um, just exposure wise. And I remember I got, I did an audition and they were like, cool. And I got down to the last three and it was like me, a presenter called Leila Annali and Roman Kemp, who's on Capital Breakfast. And I remember it was us three and they sent us out to three different um, training grounds for like the final audition but it was like a live audition that would then go out on the channel to begin with and I remember they sent um, Leila and Ali to like the Chelsea training ground to interview the Chelsea players they sent Roman to Ajax to do the Ajax team and then they sent me to Madrid to the burnabout and I remember thinking 
yo, out of all of those three, I've got the best deal here. Like, I'm going to, they're like, yeah, you're going to go there, you're going to speak to Marcelo, you're going to speak to Bayo. I was just, I was gassed. I couldn't be, I got all gas. I went to the barbershop, got three lines in my hair, in the haircut, like, probably trying to do Adidas. And I remember getting there, and I remember we were filming during the day, and I hadn't eaten all day. And I kept saying to, like, the producers and the sound, oh, I want to eat, I want to eat. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah we're going to go. Kept filming, and then the filming dragged on. It went out late. And then I remember just as the day was going on, I was getting more and more moody. Like I was getting moody. And I remember then we finally went and got something to eat, but then the whole camera crew decided to like choose, choose like some Spanish restaurant thing. And I wanted to eat what I wanted to eat, but they all wanted to eat that. And then I just went along, but I just remember not being sociable, not really speaking to anyone, like proper sulking like there. And then the next day, um, we went to do an interview and then we didn't get the interview with Bell, but we got the one with Marcel. It was very brief. And I remember being like very down about that. Like, because, but remember, this is early. So I didn't know this is all part of the game. Disappointment. Nothing's guaranteed. Like just because they go, oh, you're going to get this interview with thing. It could change at any time. You've still got to make sure that you're carrying yourself professionally. Do you get what I'm saying? Performing when the time comes, like I said, and carrying yourself a certain way. I was sulking. I sulked the first day about not getting the food I wanted to do and then sulking, not being sociable with, with my crew at the time that I just met. Remember, these are first impressions. I just met these people. Next day, sulking, didn't get the thing. Did it. And then I remember getting back to London and then um, my agent at the time saying, yeah, you didn't get the job. And I was, I was like broken. I was so upset. And I remember them, they said, Roman, go ahead, Leila, go ahead. They've gone with them too. They're the two. And I was just thinking, what? I went to, I went to Madrid. Like I thought I had this. And then I, I had to reflect and think, why? And maybe they were just better. Fair enough. But I also know that I wasn't the best, easiest person to work with. Why am I sulking? What, 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 why am I doing that? Your impression in this industry and your reputation is so important. You need to make sure when you work with people for the first time, they can turn around and go back to whoever and go, That's a ple- that person's a pleasure to work with. He's so patient understanding, polite, sociable talks, even about anything, even if it's, you don't feel like the conversation is going to help you. People want, only want to talk when they feel like they can benefit from someone. What about just having a conversation with people as a human? Mm. You know, talking about like, oh, this time I had tapas and you're just going, oh, really? Okay, what's it like? Like, like being inquisitive. On that trip, I wasn't. I was just thinking about me, 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 what I wanted to do, me not getting my way, all of these things. And since then, I learned any time I work with someone, I need to be a pleasure to work with. That person has to turn around and go, crazy, amazing to work with. That was a big lesson I learned. The other one was the Filthy Fellas thing and the Liverpool thing. That was the other mistake I made. And the mistake I made was not even necessarily the jokes I made on Filthy Fellas um, about Liverpool, which obviously were, were silly jokes, but it was more knowing that you got to carry yourself a certain way when you get to a certain level. So I felt like once I got the England job mm. and I was doing the Lions then for England, I knew automatically there was a target on my back. Mm. I knew there was a target on my back. And the reason I say that is because I was doing what many would consider a dream job. That England had never had a presenter like that before. There was never, they, this was the first time the FA had done something like that. We've got, we've got a presenter. He's going to live in the hotel with the, the players in Russia during the World Cup, interview them every day for a live show. And once you're on that level, it's a different set of eyes on you. Mm. The media pay attention to you. The press pay attention to you because it's England and you have to carry yourself a certain way. And I feel like once I got that, I started to believe my own hype a bit too much. And I, I didn't realise the pla- how big the platform I was 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 on was. Mm-hmm. And then I was out just thinking I could just tweet certain opinions and just be the same opinionated person. And I, it's not that you have to change, but, you know, circumstances change. You have to adapt accordingly. And I just remember tweeting, watching a game between Liverpool and Manchester City um, and, and tweeting that I didn't like the way uh, the Liverpool fans were booing Raheem Sterling. And I tweeted that and I was like, oh, it's sinister the way they're booing. And then obviously the Liverpool fans caught onto that, but there were already Liverpool fans that weren't happy with the jokes I made on Phil Fellas. So then being the platform that I'm on, England and all of these things, it's the perfect opportunity to go, all right, let's tear him off that platform now. Let's, let's, let's take that away. Do you get what I'm saying? 
And I think for me, that's what I learned. I learned that, you know, when you move into a certain light, I know if I get a job tomorrow on BBC One prime time, it's different now. I have to act accordingly because there's going to be a target on your back. There's always going to be haters. There's always going to, especially if like what you said, you're someone that carries yourself very confidently. Someone that, you know, you do, mm. you know, is, is quite good looking and dresses well. When you're, when you're like that, p- people just deem you as a threat. I feel like in the UK, we love the boy next door. Mm. We love a James Corden mm. or an Alan Carr or a Jonathan Ross. Because, you know, they're not going to steal your girl. They're not going to, do you know what I mean? They're like, we love that. We don't, we, we, when, you're, when you look like a threat, people naturally feel threatened by you to an extent. And that's not me being, you know what I'm mm. saying? I'm not oh, being big headed or anything. That's just what it is. Like, I felt like I've always had to deal with that. If I walk in a room and I'm dressed very well and I'm, I'm being confident and stuff, if you're not confident within yourself or you're not a secure person, you're not going to like that person because then it highlights your insecurities. So where I'm on the lines then now and I'm like, oh, yo, what's going on? Ashley, Ashley Young or me? Yes, Raheem Stern is a good... If you're looking at it thinking, why is, he, why is he so confident? Why is he talking to the footballers like that? And you're only used to presenters going, oh, um, journalists or whatever, talking to the footballers going like, what did you think about the match? And then being that way, but you're seeing this person do this. Mm. You, some people are just not going to like that. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's just the way it is. So I think, yeah, for me, I just learned that I needed to move a bit more accordingly in that respect. And you just got to be a bit more respectful about people in general, man. Like, you know, there's there's... Even with the Liverpool thing, like, I was making jokes, but I'd never been Liverpool like that until I started working for the Premier League and I would go to Anfield and do presenting pitch side at, at like, four times a year at Anfield. I'd never been when I was making those jokes on Field for Fellas. Mm. So I never actually knew what this meant to these people. The moment I started out in Liverpool and seeing what the people of Liverpool are like and how amazing they are and the struggles they've been through and understanding their story more... Mm. The episode of Full Feathers had already shot. That was already out in the universe. There's nothing I could do about that. Mm. But I understood more af- after the fact why they felt so passionately about someone making those jokes. Mm. Because there are parts of Liverpool that have poverty and there are people struggling there. And it is a very proud city. And they are people that work and they're behind labour. And do you get what I'm saying? It's a very political city mm. as well, steeped in history. And once you learn that, you go, cool, I understand. Do you know what I mean? Like you could, you could. I could have probably made jokes on Phil Fellas about Birmingham, Manchester, that they wouldn't have cared, the people in that city, or even London. You know, I could have cussed London all day long, no one would have cared. But Liverpool is a different city, man. It's a passionate city. So I get it. So I, I learned from that. And like I said, work career professionally wise, I learned from, mm. from that experience with the Adidas trip. Thank you for going into it in so much detail. It's, um... Yeah, man. It's actually really interesting to just sit here and listen to be completely honest with you. I wanted to understand because I'll be honest, I, I did my research obviously on that situation as many people would have and yeah. it's one of the things along your journey which is well documented on, yeah. on the internet. So I saw about it and one of the headlines was about you losing the England job. Is, yeah. is that accurate? Yeah, well, it, so this is exactly what happened. So that came out and then there was speculation within the FA like, what do we do? Because there are Liverpool players in Mm. the setup. So their whole thing is, Craig's done an amazing job. We love Craig. Craig smashed it. The Lions then was a success. We want to keep Craig on. There was a part of the FA, which is like the media conglomerate. So like the producers, all in the FA, Mm. England media, that were like, yeah, Craig's going nowhere. We need Craig. Craig's the guy. But then you had higher up people that were like, yeah, but what about the backlash? Like, if he does an episode now after this with Jordan Henderson or Trent Alexander-Arnold, people might get, we might get comments of people going, oh, why are you still, why is he still there? Da, 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 da. So there was that little internal battle. And I remember what happened was, I don't know what, if there was a conversation there, but it leaked to the newspapers and the press. And the press started pointing out articles like that. And then me and my agent would go back to the FA and be like, what, what's going on? Because from what I'm telling you, you're, you're not saying it's cool, like, we're fine. They're like, no, 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 it's cool. I don't know where, like, we don't know where that's coming from. But then what happened was, this was December 2019 when this happened. The Euros were coming up the next year. So then they were like, all right, what we're going to do is, we're going we're gonna to chill on you doing, because what would happen is I would link up with England during every international break, not just the tournaments. And then the next one was coming up in like February, March. So they were like, all right, what we're going to do is, we're going to chill on you doing this one and we're going to bring more people in. This is how they framed it. They were like, 
our problem, they're like, the mistake we made was we only had one presenter and you, you did everything. You did every show on the thing. You did the live shows. You do the interviews and the things. They're like, we need a pool of people. This is how they were framing it. Just in case. We need a pool of people. We want to bring a female in. We want to do all this. To their credit, they started doing that. They started bringing in loads of different um, presenters to do different things. They like, had a podcast and they had someone doing that. They had a girl doing this, like different shows and stuff. And they were like, and then what we're going to do is wait for this to die down. And then when the Euros comes, we'll bring you back into the fold for the Euros. And then what happened was March 2020, the pandemic hit. So it was like three, four months mm. later. And then obviously the Euros got pushed back. To, remember, we had the Euros mm. in 2021, mm. so they pushed all Euros back. So then all of that died down. And then as time went on, didn't hear from them. When we called them, they were like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, we're going to, we're no, we'll, we'll bring him back into the fold. But then I started seeing them bringing different presenters in. And they brought in Josh Denzel. Mm. And then he started doing all of the live shows. And then it just kind of peered out in that way. They just told me like, oh, we're going to bring you back in when things mm. died down. And it, it never happened. But I think I took, took that with a pinch of salt anyway. I think I kind of knew. But my annoying thing about, the thing I was annoyed about it was the press, yeah. the papers. I didn't care about, you know, if I was, if, if we weren't going to work together or anything anymore. My thing was like, of all the positive things I did, all the stuff, you were reluctant to post about me. And then the moment something like this happens, the press jumped on me. Do you get what I'm saying? As a person, mm. as a person of colour, it just felt like very like, yeah, it just felt weird. Like, you lot, you lot, I, I couldn't beg you lot for press coverage before. Mm. Mm. The moment something like this happens, oh, FA presenter, England mm. presenter, mm. it's a story. Do you get what I'm saying? Because you got to understand, the press and the FA, they're, they're trying, they always look for something to tarnish mm. England. They want to make things hard for England. I don't know why, but they do. Mm. And um, yeah, I was just I was just frustrated, man, because I was just thinking like, yo, like, why don't you not post anything positive about me? Like, you have only just done mm. done the negative stuff. So yeah, that's that's essentially what it was, man. Like, the hundred percent Liverpool thing played a role in me losing that position um, in the FA. And yeah, I was just I was just frustrated because I just felt like there wasn't a hundred percent transparency yeah. about yeah. it. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, I think someone should have had the balls to sit me down and say, look, mm. unfortunately, we're worried about this and we, we can't use you anymore. But they were always kind of making it seem like, oh, no, you're going to come back. When I wasn't, so. You raised a really interesting point towards the end of that answer when you were talking about the, um, the press coverage and not yeah. giving you positive press. And yeah. then the first marginally negative thing that they can pick up, they yeah. make a huge story of it. Do you think that story would have been made to the size of what it was, should you been white English male? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say it wouldn't because at the end of the day, if someone was in my position, like I said, they were on the lion's den and they offended a community of people and then people gave them the backlash for it. If they're tied to the FA and the lion's den, they probably could have got that backlash. Um, but I do think I dress a certain way I talk a certain way, I carry myself a certain way. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. And I do feel like um, there will be parts of the media that maybe don't understand that or don't like that. It's the kind of the same reasons why we talk about why Raheem Sterling was getting so much negative mm. press. And mm. yeah, I feel like they will be on you a bit more, but I don't want to say it was, you know, oh, I don't want to say a white person wouldn't get that, mm. that thing. Because like I said, I think it's more to do with the fact that I was working with the mm. FA. And there's a different level of scrutiny when you work for them. Mm. I could have been working for just the BBC. I don't think that would have, would have been mm. as bad. It's more to do with England, mm. the Lions Den. Like this is a certain establishment. Their face is a certain establishment where if you do certain things, you just have to be on point all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I weren't on point at one, at one moment mm -hmm. and that's, that's the effects of what happens. So, yeah. I think the main thing to point out though across these two scenarios that you've gone into mm. is you've learned for them and you've moved on. Yeah, 100%. And you're here today. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I do want to talk to you a bit about the present and put maybe yeah, a bit course. more of a positive It's all part spin. of the story, man. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. No, but thank you for going into it. I do genuinely appreciate no, 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 it. But obviously you have got through it, like I say. So yeah. you're doing amazing things no, at the you. moment. So yeah. what, what does current, currently consume your focus? Um, right now, man, it's obviously... I started out in... Like I said, Mitch and Swab, I started out in music and entertainment. And then I, tr I transitioned to football because there was just more money in football at the time. You know, the music industry was like transitioning through streaming. 
there wasn't a lot of money in it for musicians, let alone presenters or entertainers. And football was there. And the football content was just building. It was like, there's money in football. And I started doing that. And over, you know, the last few years, it's been good. Like I said, BBC, Sport, England, Premier League, Talks, but all of these things, it's good. But what I realised is I always wanted to do just more than football. I wanted to still be able to do interviews with musicians and fashion because the, the three pillars of my personality have always mm. been fashion, music and sport. And I felt like the last four or five years, it's just been sport, sport, sport. And I haven't been in this space enough. And I felt like the reason that was is because they can't, you kind of get pigeonholed into a certain thing when you do something. Mm-hmm. But what's the beautiful thing about the last three, four years online is I feel like because of social media and the way it's gone, you can do many, you can be multifaceted now. You don't actually have to be pigeonholed. Mm. You know, you're seeing someone like Big Zoo. He's a rapper, but he's doing a cooking show. Mm. But then he's like presenting like, you can do many different things. And where KSI is a boxer, a YouTuber, a rapper, singer, like you, you don't have to be boxed in no more. There was a time when you had, they boxed you in. So I feel like now for me, I'm just trying to use explore all those facets now Craig Mitch is a brand that's the brand Craig Mitch you know if you go to Craig Mitch you can see me dress a certain way and you might want to see what Craig's wearing fashion wise I might do fashion shows and stuff and that's where Kick Game comes in as well because it's a trainer fashion show music's tied in with that because I'm interviewing musicians or you might see me doing podcasts and that's music Mm. and then you can see me doing the football stuff BBC Sport Talk Sport Radio all of that stuff as well so I'm just trying to execute all of all of my my passions, man, mm. and and that's that's what I'm up to right now. And how far do the passions go? So you spoke about KSI doing the vast array of things yeah. that he's doing at the moment. You're obviously doing, like you say, the three main pillars. Yeah. How many pillars do you want there to be in the future? Uh, a lot, man. I think you know one of one of my favourite musicians is Nipsey Hussle. Mm. Rest in peace. Mm. Incredible, incredible mind that guy. Um, One thing he says that what stuck with me was that like, what power do you have on this planet? Now, when people think of power, they usually think of it as like a a negative thing. Like, oh, you're not negative, but like, when we think of the powerful people, people usually think that, oh, they're powerful people. So they must be up to like shorting things. No, when I say power and when Nip's saying power, he's saying, what, how can you make things move? Mm. How can you say, I want to do this and it affects culture? Do you get what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that is what I want to do. I want to be in a position where if I want to do something, it can have a big effect Mm. on on culture and can influence people positively on a big level. I feel like right now, the problem I have right now is I'm so passionate about creating content and I enjoy it that I've just kind of slipped into this pattern of, oh, I can just turn up and be a presenter and do that. Mm. When really, that isn't going to put you in a powerful position. Remember, you only got really one one life on this planet. Mm. No growth and comfort, right? Nope. And I feel like for me, the next step is to make sure that like I'm a boss, I'm in a position of influence and a position of power. And the only way you're going to do that is if you start to create things and own things. That's the only way you can do that. If you're constantly working for people, and you, you haven't put yourself in a, um, and you haven't built something or create something for yourself, then you're never going to be in a position of power, man. You're always going to be, someone's always going to tell you what to do and you're not going to be able to affect things then. How, how are you going to, how are you going to influence a large group of people if you don't really own anything? Like, yeah, you could, I could be on here and I could be influential in a way that's like creating content to an extent, mm. but that's not really powerful. Like in this world, unfortunately, we live in a capitalist society. Mm. you need money you need money to really execute things that's why you see Kanye sitting down complaining about it all the time I need a billion to start Mm. my own factory so that I ain't got to rely on Adidas and all of these sorts of things because he knows having that money he wishes it wasn't like that but having that money means you can actually do things Mm. and create things and not have to be under certain people's thumb where they tell you what to do because no matter what level you get to unless you're really really You've got power. You can't really move things and create things on a grand scale. So with that in mind, where do you stand on the happiness versus money motivation equation? What do you mean? In what sense? So what do you prioritise? Um, 
I think I think happiness is a I think people think happiness is a destination. Like what do you want to be? What do you want to do? My goal is to be happy. But you can't just be happy. It happy is an emotion. Just like sad is an emotion. Angry is an emotion. Jealousy is an emotion. These are emotions. So what does that mean? It means they're fleeting, they come and go. Mm. You no one can be happy all the time. How is that's not even possible? People think, oh, because today I woke up and today I feel down, it's a bad thing. Of course it don't feel good. But when you got a cold, it don't feel good, but that doesn't mean you're never gonna get a cold again. It's a part of life. You gotta understand that some days you will be happy, some days you'll be sad, some days you'll feel sick, some days you'll feel down, some days you'll feel that's life. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. It's just about dealing with it. The moment people learn that there's there's balance, it's yin and yang. One day you'll be happy, one day you'll be sad, and none of them will always be like that. You'll never always be sad. Mm. All right, there's some people that are actually depressed. And for those people, I pray for them. And <clears throat> I hope they get out of that because that is a bad place to be. And, you you know, it, it doesn't feel like you have happy days at all when mm. you're in real depression. Have you ever experienced that? Actual depression? No, I can't say I have. I've had days where I felt really down. I've had bouts of anxiety at points in my life, but I, I can never say, I think it'd be very disrespectful to people that are actually depressed. And I think a lot of people do that. A mm. lot of people go, oh, I'm, I'm, I've been depressed, I'm suffering depression. You don't, you don't really know what depression is. You, you know. You know, I've had family members that have had depression and you know when someone's depressed. And a lot of people just like to say that because maybe things ain't going the way they want to in their life or they ain't got... Like, I've seen some people say they've got depression, let them get a great new job or a nice bit of money. That depression seems to evaporate. Now you can fly to the Bahamas. Now you can do whatever you want to do. And all of a sudden it's a lot of depression. People talk about stems from money mm. and, and, what, and not being able to do the things and make the choices they want to make in their life. That's what it stems down to a lot of people. I'm not saying everyone. Mm. With me, like I said, happiness is not a destination, man. It's a fleeting emotion. So you just got to understand that happiness will come and go. Sadness will come and go. For me, I prioritise money purely because I live in a capitalist society. And if you don't go and get money, then you can't actually go and do the things you want to do. You can't help the people you love. You can't actually live the life you want to live. That's just the way it is. It doesn't mm. make it right. But that's just how it is. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You can sit here and people could go, oh, I'd take happiness over money. And so how are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to pay your rent? You can't pay your rent with like walking around being joyous all the time. And you can't be joyous all the time anyway. Because the moment you say, oh, I walk around and I care about being happy, but you can't pay your rent, you won't be happy no more. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We got, to, <laughs> we got to wake up and be realistic, mm -hmm. bro. People don't want to be realistic. That's just what it is. You'll be sad, you'll be happy, man. Embrace both. I'm with you. What an answer. And um, before I ask you the final question, I just want to say it feels appropriate to end there so um i just want to extend my gratitude honestly for for coming in and for bringing appreciate so much it. value and, and for being so Don't open gas as well me, bro, man. it's all good man it's all good yeah it's a pleasure being here man i like what you're doing this it's a dope platform you're having real real conversations and like i said all the ones i've watched it has that tone of being like a proper conversation that's why i feel comfortable to sit here and talk about these things it's like like you said all of this stuff is just part of my journey man 100 percent to That's end it. the journey, yeah. you spoke about shifting culture and stuff yeah. like that in your future. For you to look back and watch this or for someone to watch this in 10 years' time, mm. what do you hope your legacy will be? Um, I hope my legacy will be... It's not, even, it's not even a deep thing of like what I've kind of maybe left behind. It's more my legacy will be, you know, Craig was a great person. That's it. I feel like some people pass away and, you know, you can try it. Some people try and go, oh, yeah, they were such a lovely person. But deep down, they know they weren't some people. Mm. I feel like the more people you affect and the more people that can say that's a great person, you'll leave a legacy behind. Because at the end of the day, that's all you can do is, mm. is just make sure you be the best version of yourself here and make sure people can turn around and go, that was a good person he was a really, really, really nice person or she was a really nice person. And that's all it is for me, man. It's not even just about the materialistic things or career, all of that stuff. Like, we're all going to die. That's, that's a given. You just got to make sure that while you're here, people can vouch for you in your death and say, that was a good person. That's all you can do, man. If, if you don't do that, then to me, then you've, everything you've done here is in vain. Facts. Thank you, bro. That's it, my guy. Pleasure, man. Thanks for having me.
Thank you. Boom.